This episode covers clues missed that fateful day, January 26, 1966. Now, some are obvious, some not so. Most, though, have been hidden for over five decades that appear to indicate the individual involved in the disappearance of Jane Anna and Grant Beaumont lived in close proximity to Collie Reserve. Now there's a question that myself and Bill Hayes need to ask. Where did Jane Beaumont receive this mysterious pound note from to be seen at Wenzel's Bakery buying lunch with her newly found wealth? It was money her mother did not give her. See, myself and Bill Hayes believe that once known, we find out where Jane Beaumont did receive this pound note from. It changes the dynamics of this case greatly. See, the pound note was a pivotal piece of information in 1966, and it has been ever since. And we believe once we find out where Jane Beaumont did receive this pound note, it can unlock the mystery of the disappearance of Jane, Anna and Grant Beaumont. Now let's go back to where the clues began. It was around the morning breakfast table. The kids were really excited because Nancy had relented and said, look, you can go to the beach, but you have to be home by midday because the temperature is going to reach about 100 degrees Fahrenheit. It was going to be a stinker. And also she didn't want Jane, Anna and Grant scrambling around her feet while she was doing the chores around the house. Now during this time around the breakfast table, that's when Anna and Grant were teasing Jane. Jane's got a boyfriend, Jane's got a boyfriend, which meant at Collie Reserve. Now of course, this could have been a boy that Jane had met from Paringa Park Primary School or knew at Paringa Park Primary School and had saw down at Collie Reserve. It could be a boy that was on school holidays from another school, from another state, that she got quite infatuated with. And there is another thing too. It could be something quite a bit different. It could be infatuation. Now this infatuation, I had it with my, in grade four at Darlington Primary School, I was infatuated with my class teacher, Miss Mulligan. Now she would have been early to mid twenties, maybe late twenties, and I, for a fleeting moment, was going to marry her. Now, the only problem was that Jeff, my best mate that was sitting next to me at that time, had the same idea, but this was only fleeting. So it could have been somebody down the reserve quite a bit older than Jane. Now, let's just reiterate what they were wearing that day. Jane had a pink one-piece swimsuit. She had light green shorts, tartan canvas shoes, she had a, a blue airline type bag, there wasn't any insignia on it, and inside that bag she placed three drying towels and also her beige clip purse. I know the police report and it has been reported for many decades that it was white. In fact, we find out that it could have been or highly likely it was beige. She also put into her bag Little Women, the paperback by Louisa May Olcott. Now, Anna, she had red and white striped bathers, she had tan shorts, she had tan canvas shoes, and she had an orange hair clip in her hair. Now, Grant, he wasn't wearing a t-shirt or singlet, he had green and white striped bathers, he had dark green shorts on the outside, and he had red sandals. Now it's important to also point out the drying towels, what color. Now myself and Bill Hayes only found this out very recently. Grant had a blue towel, Anna and Jane had two the same pattern, yellow, black, green, red and white stripes and they were supplied by Lincott Linen Industries and of course that's who Jim Beaumont worked for. Keep in mind the colours of the towels and keep in mind the colours the children were wearing that fateful day. Now Jane puts her bag down at the water's edge and their towels 
and the children go in for a dip. And they're in the shallows there for roughly around 30 minutes, according to eyewitnesses. She would have herded them off the bus. She would have carried Grant and put him on her hip, which she always did, and then put him down once he got down the steps of the bus. Went straight to the beach. They would have gone straight in the water. She would have told Grant he's not allowed to go, go past the top of his bathers because that's what she used to say to him. Um, he, she used to joke about, don't you get your belly button wet or I'll get cross at you. It would have sunbaked, kids would have built sand castles. Yeah, it would have been just, a, just an average day. Now, after they finish having a little dip, for around about, as I said, a half an hour. They walk up not too far, only about 20 metres, and they place their towels and Jane's bag just behind this park bench where you can see the arrow there. Just behind that, they put it down and then they run over and they play underneath the sprinklers as many children did at Collie Reserve. I did with my schoolmates. I did that with my brothers and sisters. And of course, this is also to get the seawater off them. Now, this is where it becomes very interesting and where the clues stack up. Now, there was a man lying down just to the right-hand side of this park bench, and he had his shirt and trousers lying there. There was an older woman sitting on that park bench, and there was some eyewitnesses close by. He was lying down, and he was watching the children play. He watched them come up, and he watched them go over and play underneath the sprinklers. You could call this staring, and this was noticeable by the eyewitnesses. Children went anywhere and everywhere. There was no fear of being abducted. It didn't happen. But something did happen to the Beaumont children. Someone was watching Jane, Anna and Grant. What they were doing was what I was doing, is what my brothers and sisters were doing, was what my school friends were doing. Now, this is conjecture, and I'll go on a bit of a tangent here, but remember with this staring, it was the same as when Robin and David were digging that grave size hole, their words, at the back of the factory three days after the children got, went missing. They said that Harry Phipps would sit in his car and he would just stare at them. They were 15 and 16 years old and they said it was very eerie. Australia's deepest mystery. Remember the grave we dug in that scary fella. Now also Linda, when we do that episode, she accuses Harry Phipps of allegedly sexually abusing or raping her as a 13 year old schoolgirl in the 1970s across from his factory. She said, and her friend, Days on end, he would just lean up against the telegraph pole in the afternoon and watch her and a friend walk to and from each other's place after school. They said it was very noticeable. In 1979, near his Castelloy factory, the well-dressed businessman raped a 14-year-old girl. She has never publicly told her story before. Um, my best friend lived around the corner from behind Castelloy's and um... I remember having my school uniform on, which back then was very short, as they were back then. Um, and I ran to my friend's place. This would have been about four o'clock when I headed her place. And she only lived not even a three minute run to her place. Linda stayed at her friend's for around two hours. On her way home, she encountered the man she's identified as Harry Phipps. He basically just said, oh, hi, how are you? I've seen you around, which he did. I uh, used to stand on the corner of Castelloy's, um, and I've seen him a few times. So you recognised him? Yeah, yeah. And let's take it one step further. What about the Adelaide Oval abduction? What was the man doing before he pounced? He was watching them. That's what these predators do. They wait for a time when they're ready to pounce on their unknowing prey. Now there's a few things here. One, that man was already there when the children went up, 
and put their towels in a secluded corner or quiet corner of Collie Reserve. He was already there. He was there when the ch before the children even got to have their swim. So he was there at least a half an hour beforehand because he was watching them and he was lying down. And let's go through the, what did he look like? He was lying on his towel. He was six foot to six foot one tall. He was tanned, athletic build, early 30s to early 40s. He had blue bathers with a white stripe down either side. He had a high forehead, as you can see from this uh, sketch, identical sketch, and a longish face. The paper said sharp features. And he had fair to light brown hair, brushed back and parted to one side. There's another clue. One, he was already there. He was there before the children arrived. Is it a coincidence that the children put their bags just behind him and go and play underneath the sprinklers and with this fair to light brown hair brushed back, parted to one side? Well, okay. If I'm swimming, I've gone for a swim at the beach, even these days, well, not so much these days because I don't have a lot of hair, but when myself and Bill Hayes did have some hair many decades ago, I don't remember ever brushing it back, but some people would, and you'd brush it back with a comb. But parting it to one side, if you're gonna part it to one side, and it was quite neat combed back hair, is that you'd need a mirror, wouldn't you? Of course, it's conjecture, now, if it was parted to one side and he wasn't seen swimming at any time, none of the eyewitnesses saw him swimming, and the hair would indicate that he wasn't, wasn't swimming, what was he there for? And you don't have to be a rocket scientist. This does seem, or it's building up to, a prearranged rendezvous. Okay, the next part of the clues. Now, on the park bench, he placed his trousers and shirt as I've mentioned before, no carry bag, car keys or wallet was spotted. Now, he could have had a wallet, he could have had car keys, could have been under his clothes, fair enough. But a travelling bag, there wasn't any. It appeared that this man was travelling very light. Now, after the children start, uh, were playing under the, the sprinklers, they come back just behind him just behind him, they get their towels, they wipe themselves off of course, and within a very short period of time, Anna and Grant go over to this man, they start talking, they start laughing, and then bloody Grant starts jumping over him, and Anna, the little bugger, starts flicking him with her towel. But they're laughing and having a good time. It did look like they knew one another. A short time later, Jane comes across and starts jumping over him. Also, they're all having good fun. Now, it does seem like they knew one another. And again, it does sound like or look like it was a prearranged rendezvous because he was already there and the children came later and placed their towels just behind him. I really, or myself and Bill, really don't think this is a coincidence. I believe that they'd met him before. It's not the first time they'd met the man. It was quite a friendly, it was almost like a parent playing with the children. Now they're all having a great time and this went on for about 15 minutes, 20 minutes approximately. And then at some point, the man comes across to the lady sitting on the park bench. There was a man and his family not too far away. He was down for the cricket test, as I've mentioned before, between England and Australia, he was down, and that would have started on the Friday. There was another lady close by, and what it was agreed upon, what he said, have you seen anyone messing with our clothes? We've had our money pinched. Now, this sort of concerned the eyewitnesses. When did it become our money? Now, what he's saying right then and there is our money has been pinched. So we can answer the question, where did Jane Beaumont receive that magical pound note she was seen at Wenzel's Bakery some time later? Well, it wasn't at Collie Reserve. It had to be some other place. Now he goes back to the children. He has a discussion with them, but they're not perturbed. Now Jane's being told, or the children are being told, they've got no money. We've got no money. 
But again, she's not worried. Why? I mean, she needs money to get the bus trip home. There's no lunch for mum. She could be in trouble. And it could mean they have to walk home. What did he say to these children? You can you know, use your imagination on this one, but he was grooming these children. He was going to be the white knight in shining armor. But before we get further with that, if he had any money, and a few people said, well, he could have had money in his clothing. That's true. But if there's a thief, okay, this thief then goes to the park bench. He sits down next to that elderly lady. He slips his hand underneath or inside his pocket and he takes the money. Now, the man didn't say at any time, my wallet's been taken, but let's say there was a wallet. It would have been a snatch and grab, quick take, and he's taken everything. He wouldn't have opened the wallet, taken the money out or some of the money and put the wallet back. That's not how they work. They work by stealth if that was a thief, but highly likely, not even highly likely, it wasn't. Now, as I said, the man's gone across or the thief's gone across, taken Jane's money, taken his. If that's the case, of course, he is, as I said, he's going to be the knight in shining armor. However, that wasn't the case. When did he have the opportunity or prior opportunity to take Jane's purse? When they were playing underneath the sprinklers. That was his opportunity. This is conjecture. He's gone and he's taken her purse and he's gone and laid down on the towels again before they came over. Now, how did he know Jane had any money? Because he said, we've got no money. Well, Jane was only nine years old and didn't really think, because she's nine years old, of course. How did this man know I had any money? Or how did he know it was taken? I mean, really, the eyewitnesses who are a bit older, that would be the first thing that most probably went through of quite a few people's minds. How in the hell did this man know Jane had any money? Well, he's gone across and looked inside a bag because once he's got that purse of Jane's, he has control. This is building beautifully for this pedophile. If your plan was to entice these children somewhere, to get them away so you could do whatever it was you wanted to do. What better way than to remove the method of getting home and be able to offer them an alternative? Now, why weren't the children perturbed? Because it's the money that is the bait. There's a few ways of luring a child in these types of situations, worldwide statistics. The offer of money, puppies, kittens and sweets. With Glenelg at Collie Reserve, it was the money. What was the bait at the Adelaide Oval in 1973? We find out later it was kittens. There is a similarity there. Now, if he's gone back to Jane, Anna and Grant Beaumont and said, kids, our money's gone. What do we do? I tell you what, I tell you what, I can get you some money and you can buy lunch and then I'll take you home. And they go, oh, that's great. How about a crisp pound note? Because that's what she had at Wenzel's Bakery. If that's the case, this is conjecture, of course. A pound note would have been an absolute wow factor to Jane, Anna, and Grant. Now, if we go ahead a few days at the factory, the factory dig, we'll do an episode on that. But David and Robin, after a hard slog over two long days in 100 degree heat, were paid in pound notes by Harry Phipps. And even they said, and I've spoken to them, Bill Hayes has spoken to them, we're still in contact. They said, we remember that day for many reasons, but getting those pound notes, Stuart, do you know how much a pound note was? And they were 15 and 16. I did, I was in the 1960s up until 1966, I think I was eight years old and it was like, wow, when I looked inside my mother's purse, not that I was thinking of taking any, but you'd look and you'd look at the pound note. Now you've got their undivided attention. We finished, it was on the Sunday night. Um, he came over and told us that's it, get out of there, uh, gave us money. It was good money. Uh, I recall it was at least a, a one pound note each. The next step is, because you've got their undivided attention, what happens next? Another clue. The kids start dressing. This is just roughly after uh, 12 o'clock, say five past 12, they're ready to go. And the kids start dressing. 
But what happens next surprised the onlookers and surprised Nancy and Jim Beaumont. The man starts helping the children get changed. Why? I mean, Jane's nine years old. She only has to put, uh, pull up her shorts and put her shoes on. Anna, uh, uh, not Anna, Grant, he's four years old. Again, he's old enough to pull up his shirts and put his sandals on, and Anna's the same. Why in the hell does this guy feel he needs to change these children or touch them? Why? Because he was getting sexually aroused. He's a pedophile. This is what they do. And have a look at the colors the children had. Pink, light green, dark green, red. Have a look at their towels. Yellow, red, greens, blacks. I mean, some of these colors are darkly reminiscent of the colors that were very much liked by Harry Phipps. Now, Nancy and Jim were really surprised, of course, because they had told them about being wary of strangers. But this man wasn't a stranger. I mean, he wasn't a dirty old man, as we were led to believe as kids in the 1960s. And he didn't look scary. So why would they follow him? Because he was kind. He was gentle. He was caring. He was charismatic. I mean, today, if you look at pedophiles that have been imprisoned, that went under the radar for, for decades, English and Australian entertainer, Rolf Harris, members of the clergy, Jared Ridsdale, I, he's still in prison, 54 counts of child sexual abuse that went for decades undetected. And what about little old, have a look at Michael Guider, what a lovely looking person. He was a nature presenter on TV, and also he was the um, hired um, babysitter for Samantha Knight. What did he do with Samantha Knight, this nice looking, smiling man? He drugged her, he raped her, and killed her, and buried her close by. And look at this nice man, Larry Nasser former USA gymnast, national team doctor. He is now in prison. Look at the counts of sexual abuse. And he went under the radar for decades. They're all very nice until they're not. And I mean, really, it's no small feat to abduct three children in broad daylight in a crowded setting. What are these pedophiles like on the surface? They're charismatic. They're self-assured, supremely confident, likeable, charming, but underneath they lack empathy. See, to them, the ends justifies the means. Now they finish changing, and this is where the time factor comes in. They finish changing around 12.05 approximately. Remember, Jane, Anna and Grant Beaumont were seen at Wenzel's Bakery at around 12.20. 12.30 approximately. Around 12.05, they walk north with the man along Collie Reserve, away from Wenzel's Bakery and their bus stop. And yet, at 12.20 to 12.30 approximately, Jane, Anna and Grant Beaumont end up at Wenzel's Bakery buying lunch with that magical pound note that her mother did not give her keep that in mind for the next part of this episode. So let's start the clock. Follow him, follow the children, follow the money. They walk up around 12.05, walk north. Now myself and Bill Hayes have done this at Collie Reserve. They walk north 90 metres, the children, the man stop, the man goes into the chain sheds to get changed. So Myself and Bill walked up, it was 12.05, 12.06, 12.07, 12.08, 12.09, we're at the chain sheds. We give it five minutes at the chain sheds. So I've got 12.09, we've got roughly 12.14, let's say 12.15, around that time. And we haven't even left Collie Reserve. Now let's stop the clock there. The question must be asked, 
Why did this man need to go to the change rooms? He only had his trousers and he only had his shirt to put on. He could have done it there, but he had to have the need to go to the change rooms and walk away. There's a few reasons for that. Okay, he had to get changed. Again, don't see any reason why he couldn't have got changed with the kids. And he was heading somewhere. Was he heading towards maybe where this man lived? Now the children wait. The eyewitnesses said the children wait. They were not seen at any time walking back along Collie Reserve. That has been corroborated. So where did they go? Let's go back. He didn't have to get change in there. Why did he need to get change? Because what did he have of Jane that Jane does not have? The purse. That is the one thing that Jane was missing. Now this is where I quote Tony Zapier. Who's Tony Zapier? Well, he's a federal member of parliament based in Canberra, representing his constituents in South Australia, and he has been an integral part of this investigation into Harry Phipps and has been responsible for opening many doors that myself and Bill Hayes could not. I state, the purse was the one item that Phipps took from the children at Collie Reserve. Once he had this, he had to put it somewhere, particularly as soon as he got home. And how coincidental that the one possession lost at the beach appears at Phipps' home. Now, this is what he's referring to. I visited the second wife of Harry Phipps back in around 2008, 2009, and down in the basement was sitting on one of the shelves a beige clip purse or as Bill Hayes states, this purse appeared to be a trophy consistent with the behavior of a serial killer. It reminds them of their kill and the thrill it gave them. Well said, gentlemen. And may I quickly add, the children follow this man to the change rooms. They were not seen walking with him. They just followed behind, happy, carefree, even though they were late home for lunch with their mum. Why? This man was manipulating, coercive, persuasive and cunning. He was the Pied Piper. The truth is you believe that the main suspect was hiding in plain sight. Yes. And it's not the boogeyman. It's a person of influence, a person that's charismatic, a person usually in a position of power, of trust. He's had to win them over to get them to go with him. So it tells you about him as a person. If he looked scary, then they're not going to have gone with him. Now, it's not like today that Harry Phipps would have been so well known in 1966. Now he would have been a multimillionaire, and maybe so. But back then, he was known in elite business circles, the employees at the Castaway factory, and a few adults in that area that he was at Collie Reserve, uh, sorry, at Glenelg, where he lived. But with children, I mean, when I was a child, I saw one side of my next door neighbours, I saw the, the, the man there, Mr. Charlton, I saw him once. On the other side was Mr. Morrison. I never saw Mr. Morrison. I hardly saw any of the parents, except if they were the parents of my best friends. Now let's go back with myself and Bill standing outside the change rooms or where the change rooms once were at the reserve. The timing is about 12, 14 p.m., which coincides with an eyewitness account. A younger lady with her daughter standing near the park bench, as you can see here, stated to detectives when interviewed quite a few days later, the children were standing outside the change rooms at about 12, 15 p.m., when they both, the lady and the daughter, left the reserve. And witnesses and other witnesses said they were not seen walking back along Collie Reserve. Now, at the change rooms, this individual, of course, could have wanted to use the gentleman's or have a shower, but he hadn't been seen swimming at any time to really warrant one. And if he did shower, the children would be waiting for some time. And the longer he showers, the less time they have to collect the pound note and arrive at Wenzel's Bakery at about 12.25, 12.30. Or as Tony Zapier states, walking to the change rooms was to hide Jane's purse. Now that's speculation, of course, but it's worth considering. 
It's interesting to note comments from Chris Ellingsworth, a former New South Wales detective and instructor on criminal behaviour analysis. After reading some relevant chapters in the upcoming book, she states below. Now, firstly, Chris does not state that this individual is Harry Phipps, just in her expert opinion of how this theft unfolded at Collie Reserve. The theft of money and purse from the children and the man's property is interesting. I don't believe there was an actual theft, but rather the man created subterfuge to gain further leverage over the children by telling them they all had no money. That's the man and the children. They would all feel compelled to go with him for a lift home or go somewhere with him where they could call their mother for assistance. The theft of the money effectively stranded them and not knowing what to do due to their tender years, they fell into his care. The offender devised, implemented and exploited the strategy. Chris goes on to state, the man probably left the children alone outside the change rooms to create the impression that there was familiarity between him and the children to test if they trusted him as they awaited his return. Being briefly left alone at the reserve may have also served to reinforce their feelings of dependence on this man. Or as Bill and I state, this man's behavior reflects an individual supremely confident and intelligent a cunning, manipulative person, or as Chris Illingsworth states, a sophisticated offender. Well, on that note, this is the completion of part one, which myself and Bill Hayes feel leads nicely into part B, the time factor, which is the next episode. And when the two are combined, one, what was unfolding at the reserve that fateful day, and two, the children and the man leaving the reserve with no money. Yet a short time later, Jane buying lunch at Wenzel's Bakery for six people with a crisp pound note. Indicate the individual that abducted Jane, Anna and Grant Beaumont live close to Collie Reserve, and that person we believe is Harry Phipps, but in the end, you decide after viewing part B. In the meantime, if you want to find out the truth like myself and Bill, click the links below, like and subscribe. So until next time, when we explore part B, the time factor, I'm Stuart Mullins and I really enjoyed your company.